Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming today. So uh, today I'm going to be, uh, so my name is Deep. I'm a PhD student at McGill. Um, uh, I, yeah, I'm involved in a lot of the data processing for the Capo project. But so today I'm going to be talking about some work that I've been doing over the last year uh, with the help of uh, Dr. Margaret Kalaska, Dr. George LeBlanc, and Dr. Pablo Reyes Mora. So yeah, I think I'll just get right into it. So in hyperspectral imaging, the goal is to collect a high amount, a large amount of spectral information for materials within an area of interest. And when we look at the data sets that we collect, we realize that the sensors we use have a very pixelated view of the world. And as an end user, it's really easy to implicitly assume that the spatial contribution to the spectra from a pixel is uniform across its spatial boundaries. So what that means is that the spectra from a pixel is an average of all the materials within the spatial boundaries of that pixel. But in reality, this isn't the case. Pixels are not necessarily squares. They're not necessarily rectangulars. They're more circular in shape. And practically what this means is that we have, uh, because there's overlap in the field of view of multiple uh, neighboring pixels, what you see is that each pixel actually uh, samples a small portion of the materials within the, its, its neighboring pixels. So practically what this means is that there's this built-in level of redundancy, right? So each pixel has overlap in their field of view, which means they're both imaging a small portion of the same field. So we have this, our, this uh, level of uh, spatial correlation that isn't necessarily due to the natural phenomena in the scene, that's due to the sensor itself. So these sensor generated spatial correlations. And practically what we see this is, is as, a, as a blurring effect. So on one end of the spectrum, we have our uh, sensor manufacturers who have a firm understanding of how these blurring effects uh, uh, imp impact their data products. And on the other end, we have our end users. And although there are a lot of end users with just as much uh, expertise level, there is a large portion of the end users that might not uh, fully understand the complex dynamics of these sensors that they use. So uh, for instance, a lot of the time sensors don't necessarily provide you all the information you need to care to understand what actually goes into a pixel. So what ends up happening is that people rely on things like pixel resolution and geometric accuracy. And although those are really, really important, it's also important to understand uh, the sensor blurring and the, the, the imagery that we use. So this actually brings us to the objective, which is to characterize and mitigate sensor generated spatial correlations in airborne hyperspectral imaging data. And the, the key about this, uh, this uh, work that we do is we, we wanted to make simple tool that's tools that are approachable for all end users so that uh, we can start to kind of bridge that gap between sensor manufacturer and uh, um, uh, the vast majority of end users. So the first thing that we want to do in the study is really try to understand what goes into a pixel. What is a pixel? And in the study, we're going to be talking about, uh, we're going to be using the Cassie 1500 as an example. So to understand what a pixel is, we really have to talk about something called the point spread function. So formally, the point spread function is given as, is defined as the relative response of a sensor to a point source as a function of distance to the center of the pixel. So basically what that means is that how much a material contributes to uh, the spectrum from a pixel based on how far away it is from the center of the pixel. So in order for us to really derive the point spread function, really have to understand the uh, sensor geometry of, of the system. So we used push broom sensors. So practically what that means is that we collect one line of imaging pixels at a time as we fly through the air and at the end of the day at acquisition we kind of stack them on top of each other. One of the interesting things about this data set is because we have quite distinct dynamics between the across track and the long track directions. So for instance if we choose these nominal flight parameters for integration time altitude and speed what you'll note is that we have raw pixel sizes of about 50 centimeters in the across track and about 200 centimeters in the long track. So what that's really telling us is that if we're gonna to try to derive these point spread functions, we should try to do it in separately in the cross track and long track directions. So starting on the cross track, so we use the sun as our electromagnetic a source of electromagnetic radiation. It interacts with materials within the field of view of the pixels, which, ref, the, which means the light is reflected. It's redirected by the optics onto the detector of linear array. So one thing about the optics is that due to the design of the optics, materials closer to the center of the pixel actually contribute more to the uh, 
spectra of the materials uh, closer to the edge. So here we have an example of the point spread function due to the optics of the system. So along the x-axis, we have the across track distance in meters and along from the center of the pixel. And along the y-axis, we have the relative spatial contribution. And this is modeled after a Gaussian function. We actually got this function with, after talking with the uh, spectrometer manufacturer many times. So what you'll note and what I said before is that it has a preference. So materials closer to the, the center of the pixel actually contribute a lot more than materials close to, to the edge of the pixel. So another factor we have to consider when deriving these point spread functions is the detectors. And what, what you'll note is that these detectors have finite width. So you, electromagnetic radiation either hits the detector or it doesn't hit the detector. So practically what that means is that we have another point spread function that's equal to one within the boundaries of the pixel and is zero uh, out everywhere outside the boundaries of the pixel. So this width is uh, approximately 50 centimeters as per the spatial resolution in the cross-track direction. So when we convolve the two, we get the net point spread function in the across track direction. So in the long track direction, so here you'll note that now since we're talking about the long track, the x-axis has changed to a long track displacement uh, in, from the center of the pixel. What you'll note is that we actually have the same detector and optical point spread functions, but we have this new dynamic, right? We have the dynamic of motion. So when the integration period starts and we start collecting data for a single line of pixels, we, we scan across the ground. And at the end of the, end, uh, the integration time, we stop collecting data. But what you'll note is that we've scanned across this area on the ground. And the length of this area is equal to the integration time. So how long uh, uh, we're letting light enter the, the system uh, times the speed of the sensor. So, uh, so how fast it's going. So that will give us the, the width of this, um, the area covered by the, during a single line of data acquisition. So practically what we have is this new motion point spread function. So basically it's equal to zero outside the spatial boundaries of the pixel and or outside the, uh, um, the, when there's no motion and then it's equal to one within that, that uh, distance I described before. So when we convolve these, we get the net point spread function in the long track direction. So here I'm displaying the point spread function in, in three dimensions. And so we have the cross track displacement, the long track displacement, and then along the Z axis, we have the relative spatial contribution. And what you'll note is that if we take a look at this function from above, you, what you'll note is that although a large portion of the signal is actually within the spatial boundaries of, of one pixel, we do get substantial contributions from the materials with the neighboring pixels. And if we integrate that function over the spatial boundaries, we note that only 55% of the signal actually originates from materials within the spatial boundaries of the pixel, where it's all the rest of the contributions come from the materials within the neighboring pixels. And although this might seem relatively large or small, uh, like a small number, it's important to realize that this isn't uncommon for other uh, spectrographic imagers. So for instance, Landsat 8 has almost this exact same value. So 55% of its its uh, signal originates from within its spatial boundaries. So now that we've derived the point spread function, the next thing we wanna to try to do is analyze the structure of sensor generated spatial correlations. And to do this, we're gonna use uh, a, a high spatial resolution image that's, uh, that we simulate. So this image is about approximately 50 times finer than the spatial resolution of the CASI. And it, it's modeled after uh, a generic vegetation uh, uh, spectra. And the idea being that there's no spatial correlations structure in this, so that each pixel is randomly generated based off the distribution shown in this plot up here, right here. So what we next thing we do is we, uh, sit, we degrade the imagery using a uniform point spread function to create this ideal image. So in this product, it's the same spatial resolution as the Cassie imagery, except each pixel uh, spatial contribution is uniform across the spatial boundary. So this is kind of like the ideal case, the thing that we implicitly assume. And then we have a more realistically realistic case where we have the Cassie point spread function, which is, uh, this is actually what happens in the real sensor. Now we wanna map spatial correlations and the way that we're gonna do this is a really simple tool. So basically what we're gonna do is calculate the correlation coefficient between each pixel and its uh, neighboring pixel in the cross track direction. And once we do that for every pixel, we'll calculate the mean and standard deviation of all those correlation coefficients. So basically what we're doing is we're saying on average, how much do pixels separated by one in their cross track correlate with one another? And what's the variance in that correlation? 
So then once we do that, we'll repeat it for the pixel displacements of two to five, and then also in the along track direction. So here we're displaying the results of that analysis I just described to you. And here along the x-axis, we have the across track pixel displacement. And along uh, the x-axis in panel two, we have the along track disp pixel displacement. And along the z-axis, we have the mean correlation coefficient. And I told you before that that uh, image that, that we, the simulated data set that we have has no spatial structure, so this makes sense. So we have uh, a constant correlation coefficient with a constant variance since this data has no spatial structure. So now if we take a look at the non-ideal image, which has the set simulated sensor blowing effects, you can see that there's this introduced spatial correlation structure. So we have elevated levels of correlation. In addition, we have, especially for pixel displacements less than one, and then also we have reduced levels of variance. So practically what this is telling us is that uh, sensor-induced blurring is introducing an artificial sp uh, spatial correlation structure in, into the data set. So a lot, we see this reduction of, in variance in the uh, spatial domain, but we also wanted to see if that reduction was there in the spectral domain. And what you'll note is so along the x-axis, we have wavelength, and along the y-axis, we have standard deviation and reflectance. And what you'll see is a, a significant reduction or substantial reduction in the uh, variance in, at each spectral band. So what this is telling us is that some of the information, some of the natural variance in the scene is being removed due to sensor blurring. This is problematic because uh, second order statistics are, are very important in the analysis of high dimensional data. So now that we've characterized this, the well, next thing we wanna do is try to mitigate these effects. So this is a really simple analysis that we're gonna do. So we're gonna treat each pixel like a mixed spectrum. And, we, and basically, and we're gonna treat all neighboring pixels like pure end members. So if we know the proportion of all the end members, we can actually remove them from the mixed spectrum. So that's kind of what the analysis is based on. And once we apply that, you can see that in the long track, we've almost completely restored. So you'll see this blue line, which is the new corrected non-ideal image. So we've almost completely restored the correlation structure in the long track. And in the cross track, it's, uh, we see uh, we weren't completely able to remove it for small pixel displacements. And we also introduced this artificial decorrelation as a consequence of that pure pixel assumption that we made earlier. But generally speaking, we did equalize the overall levels of correlation and the variance in the correlation. And if we take a look at the spectral domain, what you'll see is that we've almost completely restored the uh, spectral variation. So practically what this is telling us is that we are actually reintroducing some of that information. We, we might be reintroducing some of that information that was lost during that uh, during sensor blurring. So, if we quickly apply this to real hyperspectral imaging data, what you'll see is that once you apply it, you get this nice sharpening effect in the imagery. And here we have a couple of scenes. So here you can see the building. It's the edge of the buildings become a lot more clear. So here we have a parking lot and you can kind of see the lines, but not really. And then once you apply this analysis, everything becomes a little more clear. And practically what this is saying to us is that if we apply this analysis, we can sharpen the imagery by accounting for sensor blurring. So overall, what this work did was develop tools to analyze and mitigate uh, sensor generated spatial co correlations. And the simplicity of these tools uh, made it so that uh, it's approachable for multiple end users. So hopefully we can try to bridge that information gap between end users and sensor manufacturers with the overall goal of uh, highlighting the importance of point spread functions to complement traditional parameters such as pixel resolution, re resolution and geometric accuracy. So for more information, please feel free to look at the, the entire manuscript. But other than that, thank you for uh, <laughs> watching my presentation and please, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer.